uh, Trustee Jill O'Donnell Tormey. Present. Vice Chair and Trustee Charles Shorter. Present. Trustee Berger. Present. Trustee Obergfell. I know he's here. I saw him down on the bottom. Maybe he's still Present. unmuted. Can you hear me? Yep, yeah. now we can. Great. Okay, Trustee great. Martin Burke. Present. Great. Professor Luby Alatriste. Present. The faculty alternate, alternate sorry. Ali Haider Hassan. Present. That is our new student rep. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Ngozi Okunwe is the student alternate. Welcome. Present. Great. Uh, Trustee Picant. Present. Terrific. You have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Gail. This public meeting of the Committee on Academic Affairs is now called to orders. On March 7, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202, declaring a state emergency in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. On March 13, 2020, Governor Cuomo issued Executive Order 202.1, which included a suspension of law allowing the attendance of meetings telephonically or through other similar services. Article 7 of the Public Officers Law, to the extent necessary to permit any public body to meet and take such actions authorized by the law without permitting in public in person access to meetings and authorizing such meetings to be held remotely by conference call or similar service, provided that the public has the ability to view or listen to such proceedings and that such meetings are recorded and later transcribed. In accordance with the executive order, the board meet meeting is being held via video conference with a live stream found at the CUNY Board of Trustees website. We are also testing a new closed captioning feature today, which you will see on the bottom of your screen. A copy of the calendar is also available online at the CUNY Board of Trustees website. Additional items may be added during the meeting. As a reminder, please mute your audio so we can ensure that everyone can hear. I would like to ask the secretary to take a roll call attendance from members of the chancellery and other invited guests. Gail? Terrific. So members of the chancellery and other guests, please respond present when you hear your name. Chancellor Felix Matos Rodriguez. Present. General Counsel and Senior Vice Chancellor for Legal Affairs, Derek Davis. Uh, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost, Jose Luis Cruz. Present. President uh, Vincent Boudreau. Okay. President Anthony Monroe from BMCC. Present. Erwin Wong, Acting Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at BMCC. Present. Patricia Matthews, a professor and chairperson of the Center for Ethics. Sorry, uh, for ethnic studies, I'm uh, present. Terrific. Uh, Russell Hotzler, president of New York City College of Technology. Present. Terrific. Pamela Brown, the interim provost at City Tech. Present. Amy Rodriguez, program coordinator in the New York at City Tech. Present. Great. Uh, president Daniel Lemons at uh, Lehman College. Present. Dr. Nuosu, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Student Success at Lehman. Uh, present. Terrific. Victor Brown, Associate Provost for Academic Programs and Educational Effectiveness at Lehman. Present. Janet D. Simone, the Chair and Professor, Counseling, Leadership, Literacy, and Special Education at Lehman College. Present. Okay, and Serenye Ninike, Executive in charge of the School of Education at Lehman College. Present. Terrific. You're muted. Muted, sorry. Thanks. That's okay. Uh, item one on our agenda is the report from the Executive Vice Chancellor. I now call Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost Cruz for his report. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and good evening to everyone. I want to take this opportunity to just brief the Committee on Academic Policy Programs and Research and a couple of policy items that have recently um, been presented and approved by the committee and just to provide you an update on where we are with them and happy to take any questions before we move on to uh, the agenda. 
uh, for the day. Um, and the two items um, are, first of all, the approval to continue the offering of online instruction for the delivery of courses in degree and non-degree programs and the offering of remote support services for the spring 2021 semester. And the second item is around our credit, no credit policy that was approved for spring 2020. As far as the um, mostly online spring 2021 authorization we received from the board recently, um, I wanted to let you know that in addition to having received the NYSED um, waiver to continue to operate in a mostly online modality in spring 2021, that uh, we have also recently um, come uh, to know that there is still a possibility that the US Department of Education and the Middle States Commission on Higher Education will also um, extend their uh, the authority to continue to provide programs where more than 50% of the courses are offered online into the spring 2021. Um, this is important because it would um, streamline um, our work uh, to make this happen for spring given the current um, uh, public health issues that we're all dealing with. Um, but just wanted to let you know that this is a little different than when I said last time where we were less uh, optimistic about this being a possibility and um, where I indicated to the committee that um, our campuses were um, getting ready to register each and every one of our programs to be eligible for online delivery should uh, the occasion uh, require it. Um, so we continue to prepare for that possibility, uh, but just wanted to make the, the committee aware that um, we have uh, heard that um, the extension may be provided by the US Department of Education and Middle States themselves. Um, in the meantime, we have continued to uh, plan for a mostly online spring. And as of November 16, 94% uh, of our courses that are being uh, offered to our students for spring are online, 4% hybrid and 3% in person. But when you look at it from the perspective of the number of students that have enrolled in these course offerings, we see again, similar to this fall semester, 98% um, have enrolled in online courses, 1% uh, in hybrid and approximately 1% in in-person courses. Um, as is the case with fall 2020, um, our hybrid and in-person courses are more likely to be courses um, that are in licensure programs that require some uh, in-person uh, component, um, labs and courses that uh, require studio work. Um, we continue in preparation for the mostly online spring, of course, to enhance our professional development opportunities for faculty and staff on online teaching and remote services um, and continue to uh, provision devices, um, provide emergency grants and upskilling initiatives for our students to ensure the best possible uh, spring 2021. Um, finally, um, I take this opportunity to remind all of us that each one of our campuses has um, a campus reopening plan that has been approved by the university uh, in compliance with the New York State Department of Health guidelines. The reopening plans uh, provide for each campus the conditions under which um, the campus uh, in-person activity could be expanded beyond its current level. And it also provides uh, uh, information regarding the conditions under which we would have to um, uh, shut down uh, if, if the public health conditions are so required. In all cases, generally speaking, um, the expansion of activities or rolling back of activities is subject to discussion and coordination among several entities, including of course the colleges themselves, the chancellor's office, the board of trustees, New York State and New York City public health officials. The um, only hard trigger that is currently um, in place is around campus closures and current New York State Department of Health guidance is that a campus must close if it has 100 COVID cases or the number of cases equals 5% of their population or more, at which time they must move fully to online for two weeks before reopening. We of course have not had uh, that situation on any of our campuses uh, this semester. So wanted just to provide an update on where we are with respect to that policy that was um, approved by the board um, as we head into spring 2021. 
The second uh, policy that I wanted to provide an update on is the credit no credit policy that was approved in spring 2020 by the Board of Trustees. As you will all recall, this policy was designed uh, to help students weather the extraordinary disruptions to their lives caused by COVID-19. Um, it uh, was a fairly extraordinary policy uh, meant to recognize the extraordinary times, uh, the, the move to online uh, instruction mid-semester, um, the fact that all of this was occurring at the time when New York City was in, in the peak of its um, COVID-19 uh, case uh, curve, and also at the epicenter of the national uh, and evolving pandemic. Um, the policy, I am happy to say, um, was a success. Roughly one quarter of all of our undergraduate students took advantage of it. Um, in total, 55,000 students converted a total of 95,000 grades across 24,000 classes to credit, no credit um, modality. And what we have done since then is uh, look at uh, the data for each one of our campuses and provided them dashboards so that they can track the impact of the credit, no credit selection of our students on their academic trajectory. Uh, so for example, um, concerns around um, a student getting a credit for a class that perhaps the learning outcomes were not met at the level required by a subsequent class that used it as a prerequisite. Uh, so we have been very mindful of looking at our data to make sure that we provide students the supports they need um, as they move forward in, in their academic programs. Um, the credit, no credit policy um, was not um, extended beyond spring 2020, as you all know. Um, it was not for the summer or the fall. Um, we have uh, done uh, a lot of work to ensure that our students are better served uh, during these times that are continue to be challenging. Um, and among other things, uh, in addition to the investments we have made on online teaching and remote service, uh, professional development and, and, and the rollout of new tools, um, we have also done uh, things like extend the date at which students can withdraw from a course um, to the last day of class. So providing a little more flexibility to our students to have control over um, their um, academic uh, grades. Um, it is important to note that um, even prior to COVID-19, some colleges did have credit, no credit policies in place for some programs and or some courses. Those were policies that were developed um, through their local governance um, processes. Um, we do have uh, some conversations ongoing now as to whether uh, individual colleges would be extending uh, credit, no credit uh, into the fall and beyond. Um, one of the reasons why uh, we have counseled uh, to be careful um, in those deliberations um, is uh, our issues around transferability of credits licensure requirements, um, graduate school admissions, and employer signals um, that our students' transcripts would, would convey. Um, so just wanted to make sure that, that the committee was aware of how we've uh, implemented the policy, how we're assessing the results, and how we're moving forward. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I conclude my um, report. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Provost Cruz. Any questions on that report? Uh, <clears throat> Martin Burke, I have a question. Yes, Martin. Uh, thank you, EBC Cruz. And while I'm loath to put words in the virtual mouths of our student representatives, uh, it has come to my attention in the last week that a number of student groups on respective campuses have requested a credit, no credit policy be extended, whether or not university-wide or campus specific, uh, would it be within the purview of a specific campus, not including any of the ones represented by presidents or provosts here this evening, uh, to set up a credit, no credit policy for this term in light of the continuing public health crisis? Uh, thank you, Trustee Burke. Um, the advice I would give to campuses that is that while they may have, through their local shared governance uh, processes, the ability to consider extending uh, locally a credit, no credit policy, that they be uh, very mindful of the effects doing so would uh, have uh, towards the future uh, for students. 
Um, I mentioned earlier, for example, the transferability of credit. Um, and uh, we recently, for example, were part of a national association of system heads um, consultation where it became evident that um, to my knowledge, no other system is extending the credit, no credit or pass fail policies that they put in place in the spring. Um, and very few campuses have decided to do so because of transferability, licensure requirements, uh, the compound effect of not having um, uh, traditional grades in place for uh, courses that are prerequisites to others and hence not having a good measure of the learning that has occurred in the classes. And so um, for those reasons, um, it would be something that uh, would really require significant uh, discussion at the campus level um, if they are so inclined to, to have those discussions. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other questions, let's now Trustee, turn. Is there a question? Well, I have a comment. Trustee Piquant has a comment sure. for EVC report. Um, yeah, I think um, the credit no credit policy, many students, um, it is no secret that the pandemic is continuing. Um, and it doesn't mean that things have necessarily, our circumstances have gotten easier. Uh, for students throughout their academic journey. I'm well aware of professors receiving extensive training and more prof professional development opportunities uh, to teach um, us and innovate their curriculum. But I do think it's important as a university for us to look at the ways uh, this pandemic is still affecting us academically, uh, despite things are still going and we are in a pandemic, we don't know when this will end. I think the flexibility um, with the credit no credit policy helped many students, but of course it's within their jurisdiction to decide. Um, and with advisement, it was well communicated last semester. It's important to consult with your advisors and to see your postgraduate plans to see what is going on. And at the end of the day, this decision is up to the students. But I do think as a university, it's important for us to be extremely mindful of the circumstances of, of our students who are in now. And it doesn't mean that times have gotten easier, but we're pushing through and uh, many students are still going through endless academic struggles. And also the experiences that students are experiencing within the classroom are very um, from good to bad. And I think it's important for us to be cognizant of that as well. Thank, Thank you, you very much for that comment. I'll make sure I'm not missing anyone else. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so let's get on to those items requiring a vote today. Given that all board members are participating remotely via Zoom and we, cannot, and we cannot see everyone, I will announce the resolutions and ask for members to res respond only if you would like to abstain or oppose the item. Otherwise, your vote will be recorded as a yes. If you are voting no or abstaining, please state your name and vote. Additionally, if you wish to second an item or have any questions, please state your name first for the record and let's try to avoid speaking over one another. We will take up the following items for approval. Action item 2A is the approval of the minutes of the October 5th, 2020 meeting. I move the approval of action item 2A. Do I have a second? Berger, second. Thank you. Any discussion? We will now vote. Please only respond if you would like to abstain or oppose. Hearing none, the item passes. Action item 2B, is the policy calendar. We are now going to take up item 2B.1 for approval. Policy item 2B.1 is a resolution regarding the creation of the Department of Ethnic and Race Studies at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. I now call Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost Cruz to provide further background on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Borough of Manhattan Community College proposes the establishment of the Department of Ethnic and Race Studies which will house the ethnic studies program with all the rights and responsibilities of a department. This decision was influenced by the national climate that underscores a strong need to educate CUNY students and the college community about cultural diversity and its riches across the disciplines. The new department's mission will be to create knowledge that reflects the histories, present experiences and future visions of communities that have been marginalized because of race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, and other forms of oppression. Uh, we are joined today by several esteemed colleagues from the MCC, including President Anthony Monroe, Acting Provost and Senior Vice President Erwin Wong, and Professor and Chairperson of the Center for Ethnic Studies, Patricia Matthews, who can answer any questions that you may have about this proposal. 
I want to also add that um, this is a cost neutral uh, proposal um, as it's basically taking an existing program and um, providing it um, the recognition as a, as a department. Um, I turn it over back to the chairwoman. Thank you very much. So President Monroe, do you have anything you'd like to add or would you have the provost? Just, uh, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak before the committee on tonight. I'm truly honored and privileged to have with us uh, Dr. Erwin Wong, who's been with CUNY for well over 35 years, and uh, Dr. Patricia Matthews, who will be the subject to the board's approval, the chair of the department. Uh, and so I turn it over to them to share a few words. Thank you. Professor Wong, you're on mute. Sorry, thank you. Uh, I do wanna thank the board members for, for taking the time to uh, entertain this proposal. Uh, the Center for Ethnic Studies was an outgrowth from the 70s and the civil rights movement. And it's a long time overdue that it should become a department because as we all are well aware, there are many issues about social justice and equity and inclusion that are facing the country now. And so it's incumbent upon us to have our students and the community become well aware of, of what the issues are and how to address them. Uh, the center, which will become hopefully a department, is unique insofar as everything that they offer course-wise is interdisciplinary. Uh, there are other departments which may have an interdisciplinary course, but ethnic studies is very unique insofar as every course they offer is interdisciplinary. It covers uh, history, music, literature, uh, social sciences across the board, and it's uh, long overdue for them to uh, take care of this uh, very important endeavor. Uh, I can just turn it now over to Professor Matthews who can speak more uh, particularly about it. Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It's an honor for me to participate in this. Uh, meeting and I um, thank uh, EBC Cruz. I think that uh, he has already um, uh, summarized uh, uh, the main the main points together with Monroe and and BP Wong about the importance of uh, of uh, converting uh, into a department of ethnic and race studies. Uh, couldn't be more timely uh, due to all the events that have taken place this year and have forced us to not uh, stay away from making this a central issue that only reflects the most problematic or most important problematic of our students. Um, I have been a director of the center since 2008 and uh, we were always in in a mo in a position that was uh, that made us feel that a center was also good and important and we could do uh, many things from that sort of marginal position uh, but this year it uh, we 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 offer several uh, opportunities for students to talk to discuss uh, some of the events that were taking place uh, uh, in the college in the country and in the world and they started asking for for these courses uh, for courses in ethnic studies and colleagues at the center have also faced this, this uh, same uh, questions when they attend the conferences about the importance of making uh, uh, these courses uh, central to the, to the curriculum of our students. So I think that this year, uh, this year we celebrate the 50 years of the creation of the Center for Ethnic Studies at BMCC. So we think that it couldn't be more timely to, to uh, mark it as the moment that we become a department. Um, I have, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Professor Matthews. So I, I move the approval of policy item 2B-1. Do I have a second? Berger, second. Thank you. Do we have any discussion? Trustee Piquant has a question. Yes, please. 
Uh, I'm delighted to hear that uh, this department is taking place at BMCC and, you know, these advances will be made within the campus community and the community community as a whole. My question is for President Monroe and VP Wong is that to what level is student involvement and in put into this um, department because I think it's paramount in terms of how we are going to progress the culture of BMCC and hearing student input and I would like to know how you all plan to incorporate students a part of your facilitation within this department. Well, I, I can answer first. Actually, we also had student input in terms of, of moving forward with the creation of the department. Professor Matzik can tell you that they did a survey, they spoke to the students, the students who taught in the courses. You know, it's, it's crucial. Uh, approximately 5,500 students per academic year per, uh, enroll in the ethnic studies courses. And certainly part of the movement towards uh, the creation of the department is to create uh, advisory boards and groups that can provide guidance with the department and how to move forward. And certainly there should be student representation there to help uh, provide their point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you. And any other questions? Okay, so we will now vote and please only respond if you would like to. Oh. Excuse me? Is that someone? Okay, so please only respond if you'd like to abstain or oppose. Hearing none, the item passes. We are now going to take up items 2B-2 for approval. Policy item 2B-2 is a resolution regarding the establishment of a program in healthcare policy and management leading to the Bachelor of Science degree at New York City College of Technology. I'll now call Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost Cruz to provide further background on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. The New York City College of Technology proposes a Bachelor of Science in Healthcare Policy and Management, designed as a four-year degree, the goal of which is to give students career proficiencies in the policy and management of healthcare services through a breadth of didactic and practicum, practicum courses, and by providing experiential learning opportunities appropriate for non-clinical students. This action comes in response to a projected increase of 18% for positions for health service managers by 2028. The degree will orient students to the diversity of careers within and related to the healthcare industry and expose students to issues common to health occupations while providing core skills needed to effectively lead in the healthcare industry. The proposed program will also serve the university's mission to prepare its diverse population of students for the future of work in health areas or healthcare areas in the industry, allowing them to develop the necessary skills for academic and professional advancement in, the fa in these fast growing areas, while ensuring equity and access to this vital professional field. We are joined today by several esteemed colleagues from City Tech, including President Russ Hotzler, Interim Provost Pamela Brown, and Program Coordinator Noemi Rodriguez, who can answer any questions that you may have about this proposal. And I turn back to the Madam Chairwoman. Thank you very much, Provost. Uh, would anyone from the college like to make a statement further? Trustee Fugano, I just uh, wanna thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, as many of you know, City Tech has a significant investment in the healthcare programs. And this is one uh, piece of the puzzle that we've worked on for a while. Uh, we have a bachelor's degree um, in health services administration, but admission to that program requires prior clinical experience. So what we're doing now is creating a bachelor's program, uh, which would be uh, open to uh, students that do not have uh, that clinical uh, background, but are looking to move forward in, in the uh, profession. Uh, it's been worked on for a while and uh, Professor uh, Rodriguez has been a uh, prime uh, mover on this and she's here and I think she could certainly uh, answer any technical questions that uh, might uh, be on anyone's mind. Thank you. Thank you, President. Well, I'm going to move the approval of policy item 2B2. Do I have a second? Second, Burke. Any discussion or questions? Uh, Martin Burke, question? Yes, Martin. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank the City Tech team for a characteristic, excellent proposal. Uh, I must admit that I was a little short on time for perusing it in detail this round. Uh, and I'm curious to know 
are there either standing or developing articulation agreements with the various community colleges across the university <clears throat> to attract students into this four-year program? Okay, uh, uh, Trustee Burke, let me uh, say that, as you know, uh, we've continually presented our programs with significant articulation agreements in place. Unfortunately, under the operating conditions right now, uh, we don't have any of them that have come to closure, but it is our commitment and part of what we do with every one of our, our programs is to provide that opportunity for uh, students outside of City Tech to be able to transfer into our baccalaureate programs. I would point out that uh, we have two uh, associate degree programs on the campus uh, now that uh, will uh, seamlessly transfer into this uh, baccalaureate program. So there are several hundred students on our campus that would benefit from that opportunity uh, right now. But the other articulation agreements are, are coming. They're a work in progress. Thank you. Anything else? So we will now vote. So please only respond if you would like to abstain or oppose. Hearing none, the item passes. We're now going to take up item 2B3 for approval. Policy item 2B3 is a resolution regarding the establishment of a program in organizational leadership, development, and change, leading to the Doctor of Education degree at Lehman College. I now call Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost Cruz to provide further background on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Lehman College School of Education seeks to establish a 52 credit Doctor of Education in Organizational Leadership, Development and Change program. This action responds to the changing needs of adult learners and the organizations that employ them. The proposed program will build on the college's Masters of Science in Organizational Leadership, which has grown rapidly and has put Lehman in the vanguard of leadership studies. The proposed program will provide students with the knowledge and skills that will enable them to be effective leaders in a variety of organizations while providing organizations in the region with graduates who have developed their abilities to perform leadership functions effectively. The program represents a strategic commitment on behalf of Lehman College to invest in the delivery of more online and low residency programs. And some of the costs associated with this program are in themselves investments in Lehman's infrastructure to update other online and low residency uh, ca capabilities into the future allowing this particular program to be fully self-sustaining within the first two years. Um, I am pleased to acknowledge that we are joined today by several esteemed colleagues, um, given that it's Lehman College, especially esteemed for me, um, from Lehman, uh, including President Daniel Lemons, Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and Student Success, Peter Wosu, Associate Provost for Academic Programs and Educational Effectiveness, Victor Brown, and Chair and Professor Janet DeSimone, who can answer any questions that you may have about this proposal. Thank you very much. So President Lemons, would you like to say anything before we move this? Thank you. Good evening and, and thank you for your time this evening considering this proposal. This transdisciplinary program is uh, already building on <clears throat> a very successful Masters of Science in Organizational Leadership that has been groundbreaking and has already produced many successful graduates. I've met a number of, of them and all of them speak really highly of that program. So I think we can see this as a logical extension of what has already been done. It fits perfectly within Lehman's mission to provide education opportunities to students that further their career pathways and also to meet the needs of its community, which is, a, is something that at Lehman College and I know all through the community, we take really seriously. The program really does both of those things, uh, offering something that we know will further careers for students and will prepare them either to continue in the, in the work that they already are doing or for new positions. Lehman set a strong record for fiscal responsibility, something that uh, EVC Cruz sustained when he was president and that we continue. And it's imperative that 
new programs not only do what I just described, which is to serve students and the community, but that it also at a minimum be revenue neutral and hopefully revenue positive so that it generates funds for further investment, further program development. This program meets both of those needs, both in its mission and in the way that it works out financially for the college. It is, a, it is a truly creative outgrowth of the work of the Department of Counseling, Leadership, Literacy, and Special Education, and the chair, Janet B. Simone, who is with us this evening. It really is exemplary, I think, of, of what we expect our creative faculty members to do in seeking new ways to provide programs for students and to serve the community. So I hope you will review it favorably. Uh, we're, of course, happy to answer any questions that you have. And I would like to turn now to Provost Mosu, who can add further details. Mr. President, uh, I concur with all of the remarks you've made. And, and unless there are other questions, I'll pass this back to Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. I just have one quick question. and I might have missed it. Can people go into this PhD program straight with a bachelor's degree or do they have to take the master's degree program that you have set up or another one? Uh, the master's degree. You have to have a master's to go into this. That's okay. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. So if I'm, the, I'm now going to move uh, the approval of policy item 2B3. Do I have a second? Burger second. Thank you, Henry. Any discussion? May I also make an inquiry sure. for the provost? Yes. Is there a policy as to what doctoral programs are offered by individual colleges and which doctoral programs are offered by the Graduate Center? We did uh, take a look at all of those and I'll ask uh, uh, Dr. Uh, DeSimone to respond to that. But we did an analysis of all of the uh, uh, doctoral graduate programs within the area. And uh, this one in particular is very unique because of its interdisciplinary nature and because of the things that President Lemons mentioned. But to Trustee Berger, the, the, uh, he's talking about sort of university-wide policy, right, Henry, that was your question? Yes. So the, the, the campuses can do doctorates that are more on the professional realm. Uh, and so this is, uh, entirely consistent with the university policy. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, we will now vote. Please only respond again if you would like to abstain or oppose. Hearing none, the item passes. We are now uh, going to take up item 2B4 for approval. Policy item 2B4 is a resolution regarding the amendment and replacement of the policy guidelines for centers, institutes, consortia, and special initiatives of the City University of New York. Now call on Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost once again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the CAPRA committee may recall that this policy item was tabled at the June 29, 2020 full board meeting during which Chairperson Thompson requested that the Office of Academic Affairs produce a memo describing the genesis of this policy action. The memo, which has been included in the CAPRA materials that you have received in advance of this meeting, explained that this amendment was pursued in response to a request from the Board of Trustees in 2019 that CUNY review the current state of centers and institutes at the university and better align their operations with policy guidelines. Based on our review, the Office of Academic Affairs has proposed six major amendments to the current policy guidelines in front of you today to ensure that centers, institutes, and consortia ultimately support the mission of CUNY colleges and the university. Five of the six originally proposed amendments remain. Um, they state that centers and institutes and consortia must, uh, one, enrich and support the core mission of the university, two, aim to become fiscally self-sufficient through external fundraising, uh, funding plans must specify how the entity will aim to sustain its activities and, and operations and tax levy funding when provided will be limited in duration and extent. Um, the third amendment is around enforcing term limits for directors. Additional terms can be requested by a letter from the campus president explaining the rationale 
for the request. Um, the fourth uh, area of amendments is around making annual reports publicly available. And the fifth, uh, that the centers, institutes, or consortia be evaluated every five years. We have made one major change to the proposed amendment uh, based on the concerns that were raised at the BOT meeting in June around the approval authority. Um, now, um, in the documents that are before the committee, the policy states that the Office of Academic Affairs will review the proposal for centers, institutes, and consortia and make recommendations to the Committee on Academic Policy Programs and Research to CAPRA on the approval or disapproval of the proposed entity. As such, creation of a new center, institute, or consortium at the university requires approvals at the campus and university levels pursuant to local governance processes. And then these entities are further subject to the authority of the Board of Trustees per previous recommendation of the CAPRA committee. Our hope is that given that this was the one issue that was um, in, in discussion uh, when the policy was originally tabled, um, that the committee uh, will approve the newly amended resolution and corresponding guidelines. Um, happy to take any questions, turn it back to Madam Chair. Thank you, Jose Luis. Well, I'm very happy to see this. I think we have been batting this around for a while. I would like to finally say we've gotten through, get this approved and through at CAPRA. And I think it now addresses all of the outstanding issues that were uh, under discussion before. And I'm gonna to turn to, to Henry Berger. Do you, are you have any questions with this? Cause I know you were one of the ones that did have questions before. I did. And the only question I have, this will be reported to CAPRA as part of the CAPRA dashboard or, 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 or a separate report? So um, in, in the new policy, if it's approved as presented, um, all centers, institutes, and consortia would be presented as agenda items and would be discussed at CAPRA as such before moving to the full board. Terrific. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad you're happy, Henry. It makes me feel good that we finally got here. <laughs> so uh, any other questions or discussions? So I'm going to move the approval po of policy item 2B4. Do I have a second? Second. Burke. He's just seconded. Thank you. And any further discussion? I think we've had it. So I'm going to now put it to a vote. Please, again, only respond if you'd like to abstain or oppose. Hearing none, the item passes. We are now going to take up item 2B5 for approval. So item policy 2B5 is a resolution regarding the approval of the actions in the CAPRA dashboard. I now call again on Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost Cruz to provide background. Thank you, Madam Chair. Routine academic matters, local academic policies and course inclusions in the university's general education program are presented to the Committee on Academic Policy Programs and Research in summary form. Introduced in October 2019, the CAPRA dashboard makes it possible for trustees to interact with the summary data. A few highlights from this month's dashboard include four new or revised undergraduate policies and the classification of eight new general education courses among colleges, giving students more options to study the physical sciences, mathematics, and the humanities. And finally, there are also 17 program actions, including three changes or additions to delivery mode and the creation of the Advanced Certificate in Workplace Democracy and Community Ownership at the School of Labor and Urban Studies. Um, I hope that the uh, committee will uh, favorably consider these changes uh, submitted through the CAPRA dashboard. Turn it over back to the chair. Thank you very much. So I move the approval of policy item 5 Do I have a second? Second, Alatriste. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? So again, we will now vote. Please only respond if you'd like to abstain or oppose. Hearing none, the item passes. There being no further items on the agenda, may I have a motion to adjourn? I guess I can Mo to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. second. Okay. I think the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all very much. Uh, Thank have a happy you. Thanksgiving, happy and safe Thanksgiving. And we'll see you again. Same to all. Thanks. Congratulations.